Good morning, church family. Good to see you all this morning. Good to be here and um, just seeing your faces. It's it's so good to be here this morning. And uh, as we dive into the the word of God this morning, we want to be intentional and just focus in the beautiful love of Jesus that he has for us. Because you know what? It can be so easy for us to feel overwhelmed. There's just lots of things happening, a lot of moving parts. We have loved ones who may be sick or not doing well, or maybe we ourselves are not doing well, whether it be physically or whether it be emotionally. It's taking a toll on us because we're taking care of them and then we forget to take care of ourselves. And so just a lot of moving things. And so this morning, before we start, let's go ahead and pray as we dive in into our passage for this morning. Our Father, we pray that through your Holy Spirit, we may hear Jesus this morning. Lord, we love you so much, and uh, we, we just pray that you will speak to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. So as many of you know, we are currently in a series in the book of Habakkuk. And last time when we were here together, and we talked about what it means to embrace God. What it means to embrace God. And we saw that through trials and through tribulations, the, 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 prophet, the prophet Habakkuk, he turns to God. And he teaches us that whenever there is something that is not going right, the first thing that we ought to do is to go to God in prayer. That's the first thing to do. When things are not going well, the first thing that we ought to do is to pray. And we see and and we saw in the last time we were uh, talking about Habakkuk, we saw that the prophet says, I have heard of your fame. I have heard and I stand in all of your deeds, but repeat them in our day. Make them known. Like whatever you did in the past, that's good. But I want to see you today. That's old news. And it was good. But I want to see you today. And so that is the context. That is the context. And today, we are transitioning from embracing God to embracing prayer. And so, I'm going to ask you a question. How is your heart this morning? How is your heart this morning? Well, how are you feeling this morning? The holiday season is coming. Things can get a little bit overwhelming. Families, gatherings, lots of moving parts. How is your heart doing? Are you stressed? Are you anxious? Are you scared? Are you depressed? Are you, are you happy? Are you sad? Are you going through something in your life at this point that is overwhelming? How is your heart this morning? Because, believe it or not, we all, all carry burdens. We all carry different things. And um, it, it, it can be pretty difficult to navigate those waters. But how do you face those particular times of angst? How do you face those particular times of heartache. And maybe you experience a lot of those moments in life, or maybe you're going through something right now. But when those moments come, how do you respond? It can be so good for us to go through the motions, to go through the status quo, to read our Bibles, to know about Jesus. 
to have the information in our minds, and we talked a little bit about it this morning in our lesson study. But have we internalized the words of Jesus? Are we living what the Bible says? Is the Bible, is the words of Jesus breathing life into our hearts, into our souls? Because sometimes it's much easier to escape. The world is so chaotic right now. We are living in a time where the world is so polarized. Some people are happy after the election. Some people are sad after the election. Whatever it may be. You see the news. You see the world. And even, not even to mention all the things that are happening in our own little circle of influence. You know of co-workers. You know of loved ones. And so, and, and so the tendency here is to try to escape It's much easier to escape. It's much easier to to minimize it. Many, many of our of our young people today, and maybe you find yourself doing this with Facebook too. It's much easier just to go to their Facebook and keep scrolling and scrolling down. And sometimes unintentionally, wow, we're just I'm just gonna look at this 10 minutes, 15 minutes. And then you find yourself what is called doom scrolling. You know what I'm talking about. Doom scrolling is when all your feed is completely done, and, but you still keep refreshing it over and over just to see if there's something new on there. Or maybe we, we do the same thing with, with our televisions. We watch the news or we watch a show or we have time to just spend time watching something. And so because it's much easier to escape the true reality of what we're living in or what we're doing. It's so much easier to go through that. It's so much easier to minimize it or to even pretend or to ignore than to become more in tune with the world or even with our emotions. To become, to come into the space and to confront our true reality. That takes a lot of courage. Sometimes I have to step back just a little bit. I have to step back just a little bit and so that I can see in like, whoa, let me take a moment here just to see what's going on here. And so this morning, through the teachings of Habakkuk, we are going to learn about prayer, but specifically about prayer in times of pain. In the book of Habakkuk, here's the context, as we saw about before. Habakkuk is living in a time where the only kingdom that remains is the kingdom of Judah. The northern kingdom has already been taken. The Assyrians have come. They have already taken the northern kingdom, kingdom captive. So only little Judah is the only kingdom that remains. But all of these things that were set up to be a blessing for the people have been turned upside down. The temple is the seat of idolatry. The the, the things that were intended for good, the have been turned upside down. The, the means of justice. There's, there's corruption. There's idolatry. There's injustice instead of justice. And, and Habakkuk is just looking at the scene that is taking place. And he is looking at what is happening to the, to the kingdom of Judah. He's looking at his people. And he is crying out to the Lord. Because remember, prophets were instituted by God. They're a mouthpiece. They were designed to call and to confront those abuses of power. They were often in prison or killed because of those confrontations. People don't want to hear bad news. Some people only want to hear the good things. But if you're bringing the truth, 
and I'm a prophet, and I'm of God, and I'm going to tell you the truth. No, 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 I don't want to hear that. However, in the book of Habakkuk, it's so interesting because here in this book, we have no story or at least no record of Habakkuk confronting a king or confronting leaders. Instead, we only have a record of Habakkuk confronting God. No kings, no leaders, but Habakkuk telling God his anger, telling God his annoyance, telling God his complaint himself. And that is the context of the book of Habakkuk. Because remember, we left off in chapter 3 and Habakkuk is saying, Lord, all these wonders, all these signs that you've done, but do them again in our day. Why don't you act? Why don't you move? And the Lord responds to Habakkuk and he says, you want me to do something? Okay, I'm going to do something. I'm going to bring the Babylonians and they're going to take you captive and they're going to kill all the people. What a strange way for God to respond. But with this context, let's go ahead And I'm sure that by now you have found the book of Habakkuk. I know it's kind of tricky. And let's go to chapter 1. This is the context. This is what's going on. The prophecy that Habakkuk the prophet received. How long, Lord, must I call for help? But you do not listen or cry out to you violence. But you do not save. Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflict abounds. Therefore, the law is paralyzed. Injustice never prevails. The wicked hem in the righteous. So that justice is perverted. And so today, briefly, we are going to look at how to pray, but also when we pray. How to pray and when we pray. Those words, as you notice here in verse 2, how long, O Lord, these words are familiar words. These words are words that are echoed throughout the Bible, not just in Habakkuk, but even in the Psalms. Even in the book of Revelation, you see, the people of God also cry out to God. And they say, how long, O Lord, when they look at the world and that is in social disarray, they look at the world that is in social decay, and so they cry out, how long, O Lord, they feel like they're on the wrong side of power. And in the book of Revelation, it is the people of God who are walking with him faithfully, but the boot, the boot of the empire is on their neck. How long, O oh Lord, how long, sovereign Lord, is the prayer of the saints throughout all the ages? And I bring this into light because maybe, just maybe, this applies to us today. As we look at the world and we look at everything that is happening Or maybe something is happening internally, personally, in our lives. And we cry out to God and we say, How long, Lord, must I endure this pain? How much much don't you care? Don't you see the injustice? Don't you see the suffering? And there are two particular temptations especially for the followers of Jesus in times of grief and pain. And hopefully you heard that in the prayer of Habakkuk. He is crying to the Lord. And they're both very reasonable, but also very understandable. And the first temptation is to become skeptical and cynical of God. The first temptation is to become cynical and skeptical of God. Totally understandable to speak about church and faith and God in ways of cynicism and skepticism. And I think there's a space 
for critiquing God. But if we critique God by talking about God and not with God, it will shape us into faithless and hopeless and often bitter bitter people. It's a spiral of cynicism instead of an exercise that is faith building. So instead, the idea is to take that cynicism and to take that skepticism to God in prayer. Talk to God about your frustrations. Talk to God about your anger. Talk to, talk to God about your frustrations. Talk to God about everything that is going on in your life. And you can say, well, why, why are you talking about this? It's almost Thanksgiving. We're supposed to be happy. We're supposed to be uh, grateful. But the reality is that even through the holiday season and even as we're winding in through this year, there's a lot of people who are suffering. There's a lot of people who are lonely. There's a lot of people who maybe have a loved one who is sick or maybe a diagnosis that was given. Many people who have surgeries that are coming up next month and they're going into the new year jobless. There's all these things that are happening. How can you be merry and jolly when there is disaster that is happening in your life? But the second temptation for us as followers of Jesus is that we make sure to tidy up our religious habits. But we suppress our true feelings of our laments. So we, this is a pendulum swing. So either we're on this side of being skeptic, of cynicism, or we're on the other pendulum swing of being tidy with our religious habits. And we suppress our true feelings. We suppress our lament. And that is a great danger in the spiritual life where we pray without lamenting and in doing so we become more religious but surprisingly less or more miserable than we might actually attend prayer meetings or come to church or sing songs. But we never allow God into the deep chambers of our hearts. See, that's the danger. We can go through the motions. We can go through the routine. We can do all of that. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, have I allowed Jesus deep in my heart? Is God truly the Lord and the King of my heart? Because, let me tell you, both the cynical approach and the religious suppression will land us in places of bitterness or either emptiness and despair and will keep God at arm's distance. So Habakkuk, he teaches us how indeed how to pray. We, when we pray, we must pray, but we must pray honestly. To God. Someone said, what is the best prayer that someone can pray? The best prayer that someone can pray is a prayer that is honest with God. We must pray our doubts. We must pray our tears. We must pray our fears. We must pray our crushed dreams. We pray through every aspect of our broken heart. And if you need to hear this today, you are not an unfaithful follower of Jesus if you doubt God. Anger. Are you angry? Because like Habakkuk, he's angry at God because of his situation. Don't suppress your anger and neither unleash it onto someone else. Instead, prayer becomes the chamber to unleash that anger. Let me tell you, anger is much better in God's hands than in our hearts. Anger is so much better in God's hands than in our hearts. 
And the way that we transfer that, it sometimes it takes a long period of time. It doesn't happen overnight. But the way how we transfer that is through honest and emotional lamenting prayer. Because this is what happens. Slowly but surely, over time, as I am pouring my being, I am internalizing, I am just coming to God and I'm just talking to God. Slowly, I'm shipping, chipping away this grief, this anger, this suffering into hope to God. One of the greatest dangers, I believe, in the flourishing life, or at least in, in prayer life, in times of grief and pain, is to carry the extra burden that our prayers must be nice and tidy. We use these long, eloquent words as if God actually cares about that. And here's the thing, you don't need that extra burden in your life, especially if you're facing hard times. You don't need another burden, but sometimes we add this extra mental burden and that we must come to God with only praises, but maybe, just maybe, in times of grief and pain, the only appropriate way to address God is to come to God with our true, raw, and honest emotions. Eugene Peterson puts it wisely and he puts it this way. It is better to pray badly than not to pray at all. And what is he saying? He's saying, and what he means is there's not really a bad way to pray, but mainly to show up. Take your cynicism Take your skepticism and then bring your fully honesty to God. When we take that pain to God in prayer, we practice and we exercise hope. And when we do it in prayer, we inch away from the crushing memory of yesterday and little by little towards the hope of tomorrow. Have you ever heard that saying that says one day at a time? I don't need to worry about tomorrow. What did Jesus say? Tomorrow will bring what? All I need to worry about is how I'm with God today. One day at a time. This is how we pray. And when Habakkuk he, when he prays, look at verse 1. He says something like, but you do not listen. Have you felt like that sometimes when you pray to God? I've been praying to you, God, for such a long, long time, but I feel like you don't listen to me. I feel like my prayers are not even going up the, uh, more than the ceiling. Or maybe, just maybe, you're sitting here this morning and you have been praying for a son or a daughter, someone who is far away from Jesus or someone who is not even interested in coming to the church. The mother's prayer, praying for for a son or a daughter, a loved one to come back to the Lord. Just praying Five years, 10 years, 20 years. I've heard of miracle stories. And you just keep praying, just keep praying. Some have observed this way and the status that Habakkuk is talking about. This, 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 this time that he's talking about, you know, that moment where you're praying and you're asking God and you, and you feel like, man, you just don't listen. You feel like this silence, like this quietness, like what's wrong? I'm doing the right thing. I'm coming to church. I'm doing my devotional. I'm coming to prayer meeting. I'm, I'm doing all the things, all the, like, am I missing something? <laughs> but yet you see no answer, apparently. 
Some people have observed that whenever you are in this type of situation, this is a way of us learning that maybe Habakkuk has been praying for this prayer a long, long time. You see, we're just getting glued in. We're just getting keyed in into this prayer. But Habakkuk has been praying this prayer for a long, long time. This is not something that he just started praying. We're just being keyed in into the conversation that he is having with God. And maybe some of us, or maybe all of us, we feel like Habakkuk too. We have been praying that long, long, long prayer. John of the Cross is known as calling this type of experience in our walk with God as the dark night of the soul. And we see it all over throughout the church history in the Bible of people who truly and honestly follow God and yet experience the other silence of God. For example, the psalmist is known for saying, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. The psalmist does not seem to equate the valley with God's absence, but with God's comforting presence. I don't know if you ever felt this way. Like God has abandoned you. I don't know if you ever felt this way. Like you just keep praying and praying and just hoping for something different. Hang in there. Do not give up. One day I was driving north and I was having such experience. I, I, I was just, as I was driving, I, I take those moments to talk with God. And as I was driving, I just felt so frustrated. And I, I, and I was just unleashing my anger to God. This and this is not going right. And why is this going this other way? And this could be better. You know, sometimes when that moment comes when you think you know more than God. And you just start talking to God and it's like, well, if this could happen, then this would be that, then that would happen. And then this would happen. It's just, and so you already have it in your mind all fixed up. God, I don't need you to do all of that. I just need you to fix this. So that way, in the sequence of my mind, everything will go smoothly. But as many of us know, that's not how things work. Psalms and Isaiah chapter 55, Jeremiah, Isaiah says, your ways are not my ways, O Lord. So here I am, I'm, I'm driving in the car and as I'm talking to God, there's a moment where I start challenging the Lord. And I said something along the lines of, Lord, if you're still with me, Show me, because I just can't see you. I don't sense your presence. You know that sense of abandonment, of just feeling all alone? And here I am, and I'm just driving, and I'm just pouring out my heart to the Lord, and I'm just crying out to God. And, and, and I said, if you're with me, show me that you're with me. Because right now, I can't feel that you're with me. And of course, God's presence is not a feeling. Sometimes it can be manifested in a feeling. But God's presence is a promise. He's always with us, even when we don't feel it. And at that moment, just as I was finishing the prayer, I looked up. And as I looked up, There was a hill, and in the hill there was a cross. And in that cross, on top of the cross, the words, Jesus. 
Boy, when I saw that, I started crying. Because I knew that at that very moment, Jesus was confirming to me that he was truly with me. And that was just the neatest experience. The dark shadow or the dark night of the soul does not mean that that that's God's absence. It can actually be an attempt of God's very presence. Lisa Kosar puts it this way, God speaks in both thunders and whispers, but it is in his silence that he speaks much more. Silence, you see, is a time for self-reflection, for listening. Lean into that silence. For the silence of God in dark times is not an indicator of his absence, but possibly the greater, the greatest indicator of his attempt of intimacy. It is in the silence that creates a space for us to be drawn to God, and we should not be surprised if we encounter silence in pain and in grief and in sorrow. But instead, let us remember that God maybe yells at his enemies, but whispers to his friends. And if he whispers, it's because he is close. Finally, as we are winding down this morning, did you know that Jesus also prayed? There is a prayer that is recorded in Psalms 22. Jesus is there and he is praying. He's praying to God and as he is surrendering himself, To the Father's will, he is praying out and he's saying the words, My God, my God, why are you forsaking me? You see, God also felt that sheer absence of God, the Father. In that moment that he was experiencing that shame, that grief, People were ridiculing him. People were spitting upon him. And he's there hanging on the cross. And you know what? One of the most beautiful things for us to know is that because God went through all of that, he is our greatest empathizer. He can sympathize with us. This is the greatest thing of the gospel. Because he could have just come. But what difference does it make? If he does, he came as God in flesh. He experienced the same things that we experience. And in the book of Hebrews, it says that he knows our weaknesses. Therefore, we can approach the throne of grace with boldness, with courage. For what? So that we can find mercy. Isn't that just the greatest promise? Jesus, by crying out to His Father in His time of utter pain and grief, He was planting His tears in the Father. So what does that mean for us today? If Jesus was willing to place his life, his suffering, and his coming death in the hands of the Father, then we can be encouraged to place our fears and our tears and our griefs and our sorrows in the hands of God. If Jesus did it, maybe we should too. Why are we carrying all these burdens on our own? When God has freely offered this to us, and He's saying, My child, my daughter, my son, I am here, not only just so that you can give those burdens, but I am willing and able to carry those burdens. And I think 
Henry Nguyen writes it better than what I can say it. And he says, suffering invites us to a place of hurt and to place our hurts in larger hands. In Christ, we see God's suffering for us and calling us to share in God's suffering love for a hurting world. The small and even overpowering pains of our lives are intimately connected with the greater pains of Christ. And I want you to hear this because I don't want you to miss this. He says, Our daily sorrows are anchored in greater sorrow and therefore in a larger hope. Our daily sorrows are anchored in greater sorrow and therefore a larger hope. If Jesus was willing to plant his tears in the Father and the Father would turn his violent death into resurrection, then we plant our tears in the Father. Think of that. Think of what he will do. If we trust God with our tears and with our fears, then the sky is... Jesus is the God of resurrection. He is the God of infinity and beyond. He is the eternal one. He is the most powerful person, yet the most tender and loving person. And I want you to believe that. I don't want you to leave this place without having grasped that. And this is it. If you missed it, this is it. The greatest and the most powerful being is also the most tender and loving being who can we can trust all of our cares with. The greatest and the most powerful being is also the most tender and loving being who we can trust all of our cares with. So what are you caring? What are you struggling with? What's the burden that's over your shoulders this morning? What is that one thing that you have been praying for over and over and over again? And you feel as though it's not going anywhere. Lay your burdens down to Jesus. Give Him your all. But most importantly, be honest with God. Don't try to do that all on your own. Don't try to navigate the chaotic and the rough waters of this world on your own. Because believe me, you will fail miserably. The only way that I know how to move forward, to navigate this world, to navigate the unknown. I don't know what's going to happen next month. I don't know what's going to happen next year. But the only, because I have no control over it. But the only thing that I know is today, right now. And that I can give my heart to Jesus. That I can do. Let us come to God. Let us walk out these doors, believing in the promise, believing in God, that God is with us and God is for us. Let's go ahead. And as we are winding down, I just want to pray right now. Close your eyes. Let's pray. Our Father, There's a lot of heaviness in the room. There's a lot of things that are going on in our lives today. And Father, we just want to be intentional about just releasing that, handing it over to the only one who is able to be the difference maker. Lord, there's just so much. And... Um, 
Many times it's just really hard to know how to navigate those waters. But you are inviting us to come, to come to the living waters of Jesus. And so, Lord, wherever it is that we find ourselves this morning, we pray that through the power of the Holy Spirit, you would bring comfort and peace to our hearts and to our souls. Most importantly, embrace us. Help us to recognize and to know that we are not alone, that you are with us, and that you are journeying through this thing that we call life together with us. And only with you, we will be able to stand. So Lord, affirm us, confirm us, and be with us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.